Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Phoenix, Arizona, it's time for Phoenix Business Radio, spotlighting the city's best businesses and the people who lead them. Good afternoon and welcome to Collaborative Connections Radio Show and Podcast. I'm your host, Kelly Lorenzen, and we are coming to you live from the comforts of our home or office while Kara Nowicki is in the studio at Phoenix Business Radio X inside Mac 6. Collaborative Connections is a radio series created to bring entrepreneurs, nonprofits, and associations together to build relationships, foster collaboration, and grow a stronger community together. Our hope for today is that listeners and guests alike will walk away with a golden nugget or a new resource for their business. The sponsor of our show, KLM Consulting, is an on-demand concierge marketing and project management firm with over 17 years of award-winning business savvy. KLM Consulting helps fast-growing companies and entrepreneurs build brand and brag about their businesses. Today, I have the honor of being in the studio with three amazing guests that I'd love to introduce you to. Because we are on air, they can't see our, your smiling faces, but we are on Zoom as well on video recording. So Karen Nowicki with Phoenix Business Radio X, welcome to the studio as my guest <laughs> and producing at the same time it's great to be here thanks for having me do both <laughs> thank you and jess Ham hamicky with center for vein restoration thanks for being with us today of course thanks for having me i'm so excited to get to speak with you and get to know you guys a little more we're excited too and dr mitzi crockover thank you so much for being here institute for mental health research and uh, lots of other things we'll hear about you, you working on these days. Thank you for being in studio with us. My pleasure. What Karen just said reminds me of how women usually do things in that's multitask. <laughs> that's for sure. That's for sure. Well, we'll jump right in. So we're wanting to get a little bit um, background from each of you, why I invited you on the show today. Um, you know, the topic that I thought we could talk about several topics actually, mental health, self-care, uh, prevention, women's wellness, uh, all these things, trauma, you know, there's so many things going on right now and we have a lot of people who are, you know, suffering or some are in a good place, you know, and, and why is that, you know, what, what are they doing differently than others are doing? Uh, I love the quote I've been using, I think uh, Jennifer Bur Burwell with Max 6 said it, we're all in the same storm, but we're in a different boat, which I just love that because we're all coming at it from different perspectives. So this is the perfect way to do that, bringing all of you here together to talk about all of this. So uh, for, for the listeners, let's talk a little bit about your backgrounds and your, what you're working on today, and then we'll get into the nitty gritty of it all. So Karen, I'll start with you. Thank you. I'm Karen Nowicki, and I own and operate Phoenix Business Radio X, uh, sitting in the studio today. Uh, prior to owning the studio, which has been three years now, I um, am an integrative coach professional, so I work with folks on mind-body-spirit connection, and whether that is to help them in their life, their personal life as, as a parent or an employee, uh, really just a you know, contributor to society, or as a business owner, I tend to um, work with people who are just looking for an opportunity to get to know themselves better. And oftentimes that includes uh, some shadow work and, and healing some of the aspects of themselves that, that have kept them stuck or playing small. Uh, a lot of folks through Business Radio X don't necessarily, haven't known me in that light because the last three years I've really shown up professionally in this space, helping people like Kelly uh, produce uh, and create a, a fantastic podcast and radio show for businesses. Uh, more recently, the last uh, 10 months, my family and I have experienced personal tragedy. tragedy. My husband uh, attempted suicide back in October 2019. Uh, it's fascinating to me because this is, you know, the love of my life and, and somebody I've been with for 15 years. And I often am in conversation around wellness and personal care. And um, he was not on my radar. Uh, I, you know, he chose to keep uh, his, his uh, struggles very private. And so um, with Kelly's help and a handful of other people who, are, who grew very close to me, some I've known for a very long time, um, I've been um, very blessed to have made my way through the last 10 months, not only our family situation, but then of course, of course this COVID craziness. 
Uh, and I'm grateful for not only the circle of friends that I have, but also the fact that I have been very careful around my own well-being. I've dealt with depression in the past, um, postpartum depression, but I've made it a lifelong pursuit to learn more and more about myself and stay as healthy as I can. And I'm also very vocal about uh, and, and share my journey along the way, because I know there's a lot of people, again, who who uh, suffer in silence or they don't really know how to ask or share. And so I've been called to do that uh, and most recently became a trauma guide. So we'll get to talk about that in a little bit. I think that's one of the most exciting things that um, I've done recently to take care of this newest layer of my life. So again, Kelly, thank you so much for having me. Yes, so many things. We have so many facets in our life, don't we? And you're so good at sharing um, so candidly about all of it. And I think that's really critical. I remember back in January when we, or February now, I can't remember when we were putting on that event, so many people reached out to me because I was advertising or marketing it, right? Um, on purpose because I think people needed to hear it and needed it. And so many people told me their stories that had never told me their stories before. Um, and people were more willing to share because you shared because we were willing to talk about it. So that, so thank you for that. Jess, tell me a little bit, well, I know about you, but tell the <laughs> listeners a little bit more about you. Sure thing. So my name is Jessica Homicki, and I have been with Center for Vein Restoration for about five years now. Um, I love my company, so I'm so happy I get to get out here and tell the world about it. Um, we care just so much about the people we're treating. And what my job is, is I'm a physician liaison. I work with now Dr. Morrison in Gilbert and Mesa, Arizona. And we're seeing a lot of women and men um, that are having underlying issues with their veins and they just don't know where to go and their doctors don't really know which way to treat and what to do first. So I get the fun job, which I love to go speak with physicians in the area and let them know that we're here for them and their patients. Um, I want to make sure that I become a middleman for Dr. Morrison and the providers now that are sending to us. They need just as much care as their patient does. They're busy enough. With everything going on now and people are just sitting on the couch and slumped, we got to get out there, uplift everyone, let their leg, get them feeling better, help their legs. And, and that in all will help their emotion as well, I think. So it's a That's great huge. That's huge. And I know Dr. Morrison, Dr. Morrison is my father. And at one point uh, we, we worked together and he, I know he appreciates all you do because he doesn't like doing any of that. <laughs> he just, he used, it used to, it was a family business we had. And my, he always said, my mom, your, your mom is the boss. I just, I just work there. <laughs> right? And oh, how funny. <laughs> That is his mindset. And let me tell you, it's great because he is a lovely physician. And I actually had just posted something on Facebook. We were looking for a nurse and the amount of compliments this man got on Go Gilbert was absolutely astronomical. It just made me, it made my heart feel good. It was great to see. Oh, that's sweet. I get chills always, of course. <laughs> I'm a little biased. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Dr. Krakow, please tell us a little bit about your background and what you're working on now. Sure, and you're going to call me Misty for the rest of the time, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, Karen, my heart goes out to you and your family. And I know from personal experience, when someone has a mental illness or mental challenge, health challenges, it affects not only them, but, but everyone around them. So thank you for sharing that. Um, my story is that I'm an internist by training and previous practice. I had the privilege and opportunity to create the Iris Cantor UCLA Women's Health Center, certainly not by myself, but with my colleagues as well. Um, we were uh, recognized as a center of excellence in women's health um, by the Department of Health and Human Services. And I went on to Humana um, because I wanted to, I was actually curious about how an insurance company might um, focus on women's health. And I was just really going there for the interview just to see. And when they offered me the position, it was really um, too interesting and exciting a, a, um, an offer not to take. So we moved to Louisville and was there for four years. Um, and then uh, we, my family moved to Phoenix um, and we've been there ever since. 
Uh, and so most recently, I was the uh, director for the Health Futures Council and Advisory Council at ASU. But my passion has always been women's health. And so interestingly, um, a number of companies that were startups focusing in this area came to me for my clinical expertise. And I thought, you know, this is the way that you might be able, again, it's a new way to move the needle. And so I literally wanted to be invested in it. So I sought out and was uh, happy to find Golden Seeds, which was an angel investment organization. So we fund early stage companies that are led by women. And um, they have uh, chapters all over the country. And I joined their health sector group. Um, so we see everything from uh, life science companies to wellness companies. And so that's really been a great experience for me, both in, in education and also being able to share my expertise. Certainly my, my sweet spot is, is femtech or women's health. So I've been able to do that. And most recently we actually started a chapter here in Arizona for angel investors. So that wanna focus on um, helping women. So that's been very exciting. My other focus, which is not necessarily separate from women's health is mental health. And because of that, um, was very honored to be part of the board of the Institute for Mental Health Research here in Arizona. The Institute funds early stage research um, that then, if it's found to be uh, solid, can go on and get bigger grants um, to, from the NIH and larger foundations and so forth. And so I guess my, you know, it's, it's a theme there in terms of investing, you know, in early stage kinds of uh, entities that then go on. And we're very fortunate that with the $2 million that we've invested in Arizona researchers in mental health, we've brought those researchers that then brought back about $20 million to themselves, the Arizona um, institutions from which they are from, and also the um, economy. And uh, just very quickly, uh, the way that we differentiate ourselves is because we are focusing on research. We have lots of great organizations focusing on education and advocacy um, and, and, and services, but this is one area where I felt like it was a, a really great opportunity to make a difference in that way. You don't hear that often, you know, you hear, you hear mental health and you hear the advocates, which we all need, but you, but before I met you, I didn't know about, you know, but it makes sense. We need the research. We need people to study this stuff. Um, and most recently the, you know, research on mental health from COVID. I mean, that needs to be talked about and researched and studied. And so I was very excited to, you know, to help that, um, get out there, get the word out there. Yes, and you were extremely helpful. We had our first webinar, and if it weren't for Kelly, um, we would have uh, been doing it blindly. So I really appreciate it. It was very successful. Thank you. So now everybody knows why I invited all these guests together. <laughs> can you see the <laughs> Can you see How you the make theme? connections? <laughs> that, that, is the, that is the point of the show, for sure. Um, Karen, talk us through a little bit about your new, um, new love, newfound you know, excitement in your life about the trauma, trauma, trauma mentor, or are you calling it trauma guide these days? It's kind of interchangeable. Uh, so we have uh, Julie Gustafson, who is a common connection between Kelly and I uh, to thank for not only my own healing through my trauma, but also that of my 13 year old again, this most recent year when Kelly was a witness to me, you know, just trying to figure out how to get through the chaos and the grief uh, and run a business and still be a parent and a spouse and spend all my time at the hospital for two months, you know, just all that. Uh, she said, I would love to introduce you to Julie Gustafson, who had worked with your family uh, successfully to help heal trauma. And um, when I went and did my own work, I've done a lot of uh, counseling and therapy and coaching, not only for myself, just as an individual to grow in my own knowingness and, and my strength and self-care for me, but also professionally, again, being an uh, integrative certified uh, coach through John F. Kennedy University and all the other things. I'm also a towel guide. I just was drawn to the work. And Julie and a handful of other practitioners have learned from Dr. Wayne here in the Valley around this type of trauma integration work. And, and the whole idea is really to um, take folks through a self meditation, a, guide, a guided meditation where we as the guide are there just to support them in 
going within and seeing where they might have trauma. Now, sometimes this shows up for people as an actual memory and a story to share. Other times it's a physical uh, presence that they tap into first uh, and um, just holding space for them to work their way through it uh, until they can begin to kind of reintegrate everything back. Because when we experience trauma in our body, in that moment that the shock takes place, the prefrontal cortex shuts down and we are in survival mode, right? And so we don't process events or experiences like we do everything else. It, it, we go into chaos. And so in order to heal that in our body and our emotion and our well-being, it has to be a real um, interconnected opportunity. And that's part of the work that we provide. Uh, we are uh, fast growing. There are five uh, practitioners right now, and I don't think that's the right word, but five guides or mentors. And um, the, the team is quickly looking at expanding that. Um, we're working with healthcare professionals, uh, the counselors, the therapists, the doctors, the folks who have the college uh, and, and the university degrees, you know, the plus plus, uh, because we know that this work is needed. And I, I love that Jess is with us too, because you talked a little bit about physician care. Some of the clients that I work with are really high profile clients. So politicians, doctors, attorneys, folks who give so much of themselves uh, and have a lot of people and a lot of community at stake. If they're not well, if, if they are not showing up whole and, and really taking care of themselves, not only can things break down for them, either in their home life or, or uh, you know, professionally or even um, financially, what, or the combination of it, but the fallout as leaders becomes um, quite frightening. And I think we're seeing more and more of that, um, especially to Kelly's point with COVID. And so one of my goals is to make sure that we have trauma-informed workplaces. So uh, I love the work that we're doing. I know that's a, a mouthful. I'm happy to talk more about it, but also want to share the, the panel time here as well. I was so glad when, when you know, I talk about Julie's work um, to everybody, anybody who will listen, because it's different than any other counselor. It's different than any other kind of therapy. It's so different and so and works so well um you know that i i would love to shout it from the rooftops right um and so i was so glad when you actually you know because a lot of people don't they don't if they don't know about it and they don't understand it and it's new and weird then they don't want to do it because right because it's change it's different so i was so glad that you act you know that you wanted to go and i'm just so thrilled that you are going to continue to work and, and do it for others because everybody if we if we cleared all of our traumas as kids growing up even you know even in the last five years ten years if we cleared all of that what would mental health lo look like you know what would it feel like what what would would our prisons be you know not overcrowded would we have less crime you know from clearing all that trauma I really do feel that in my heart and my bones that if everybody cleared all the past traumas that they, we just wouldn't have so much, so much chaos. I definitely want to hear from uh, Jess and Mitzi, but I want to share the story about my 13 year old who, again, you know, this last year has experienced something that, that we wouldn't want anybody to have to experience with his dad landing in the hospital uh, in TQ for a month and then post acute facility for a month after that. And just the very idea that he attempted to take his life and so how do you make sense out of that, you know, even as a spouse and an adult, let alone a 13 year old? Well, the work that Julie did with him, this trauma integration work was phenomenal. And, and he went somewhat willingly because he, he has these kinds of conversations with me. That's just our relationship and the work that I do. He does yoga with me and that sort of stuff tries to try to keep him in his body. And, but he's also a 13 year old boy, like all boy. But, and, and I sat in on the sessions and I, and I witnessed um, his ability to process those shock moments as it related not only to what we went, went through with his dad and how he processed and filtered and where he got stuck and where the shock lived in his body, but also the, the areas that he wasn't even aware that were traumatic for him. An experience with a third grade teacher years ago uh, that showed up when he was doing his process and, and he could feel it in his body as she worked through that with him and release. And two days later, having him tell me on a walk early morning 
morning with our puppy, like, mom, I'm feeling so much lighter. Do you think it could be because of this? Like that's language of a 13 year old. And, Amazing. And, and so the, the work is, is uh, incredible. Again, I want to sit back and, and listen to uh, Mitzi and, and Jess as well. But I think that's important because to your point, if we were able to um, all be aware that our past is that, it's here to inform us, it's here to provide experiences, but we don't have to be chained to our past. If we can release ourselves emotionally and make peace with um, different areas of our life, we'd all be a lot kinder to each other, certainly being a lot kinder to ourselves. Absolutely. And Jess, uh, you know, to, the, to Karen's point about the physicians and, and you educating them and, and giving them more and more resources about what to, how to help their patients, how to help themselves. Um, tell us, for, for those who don't know, what um, varicose and spider veins are, what restless leg is, and, you know, it, it can be in snippets, of course, but, um, you know, people are sitting more, they're home more, the swollen legs are happening more. Um, you know, if you don't do the preventative stuff ahead of time, you're going to end up, you know, having a lot worse, right? So prevention and self-care is huge. Oh, yes, yes. We see many patients of many different walks of life. Um, through COVID, we are actually seeing a lot of very sad, unhappy, people are gaining weight, um, and they just don't have the resources. So I love to go speak with the providers and let them know that we are here for them. We even have a medical Uber to pick them up. Um, we truly want to make them feel better, especially in this time of need. Um, we treat a lot of varicose veins, also spider veins. Varicose veins are larger bulging, bulging veins that develop in the legs and can be seen through the skin. Um, this happens when the vein valves become faulty. And I like to explain it like a hose, a watering hose. So if you put a watering hose and you snap it in half, the water is not going to come out. It's going to get a little stagnant and yucky um, and it has nowhere to go. So that hose is going to build up and build up and build up. This is what a varicose vein is doing with the valves is the blood is pooling and it has nowhere to go. And that's making these patients feel so uncomfortable when in reality, um, with just a little bit of education, we can let you know that we can get rid of this in 20 minutes, a couple procedures, and you're going to be feeling great after. Um, it's been it's been a wonderful experience with Dr. Morrison too because he's just such a great educator and he's so amazing with his patients. Um, and in the most part, people understand also that this is necessary because if you don't treat it in the early stages, it is a progressive disorder. It will get worse to the point where you can now have ulcers opening up on your ankles. Um, skin discoloration is one of the first things we ask everyone to look at. And it's just been a great experience educating people. And let me tell you some of these success stories we've had. Uh, we just had a woman that got nine inches taken off of her ankle because we were able to treat all of those bad tributaries and the lymphedema in her legs. Isn't that amazing? And people don't know the correlation. They don't know if I sit too long, you know, I'm going to have swollen legs. I'm going to have restless legs. I got to get up and move. I got to do the blood pumping. And then, oh, now I'm going to get varicose veins. And then if I don't fix those, I'm going to have blood clots and I'm going to have the, you know, all the ulcers and everything. So it's prevention. It's the same as mental health, yes, right? It, it is. It goes it, hand in hand. And when you fix one, you're fixing the other. And it's just been so great to see people getting a little more active getting out there, the weather's getting cooler. Um, it really does go hand in hand with each other. It's great to see. That's exciting. Mitzi, I'm not going to call you Dr. Crockover anymore. I don't <laughs> tell us, tell us a little bit more about the, what you're seeing in, you know, in your, all of your jobs with COVID and, um, you know, and mental health and what's going on in your world. Sure. Um, you know, it's interesting, and Karen was talking about um, working with professionals. And I'm one of the questions, I have two questions for you at, at some point, but one is, you know, how do you get those individuals to come to you? Because I know that that's, it's hard for, especially for providers who are already providing to ask for help, um, no matter who that is. Um, one of the um, focus or the focus that we are really uh, putting a lot of um, attention to um, with IMHR, Institute for Mental Health Research, 
is COVID-19 because as someone described, it is a coming tsunami and it's already at the shore, right? And obviously the um, overwhelm uh, and the trauma of first responders and physicians who were already experiencing burnout. I mean, before this was talked, we were already talking about the, um, you know, just the issue of physician and nurse burnout. So just layering this. Um, the second piece is the social isolation. And certainly for everybody, but specifically for our youngest and our oldest are very, uh, you know, problematic. Um, those who already have had some mental health challenges, this has not helped um, at all and it's exacerbating and the, with the social isolation and maybe not being able to access um, care, um, making things even worse. We also know that domestic violence and child abuse has gone up. So those are obviously um, significant issues. And then we also do not even we are starting to know the direct effects of COVID itself on the nervous system. Uh, there was a patient that was talking about um, how he had, you know, gotten over the, the worst part of it. And he said, at first it was terrible because I couldn't breathe. And now that I'm kind of over this more acute phase, I can't think. And we don't know why that is. And we don't know what, you know, uh, the, the, the fallout is going to be. And so IMHR um, has focused uh, a fund uh, that is specific to COVID-19. And what we're finding is that the researchers are easily, if they're already doing research, it's very easy to include that because I think it's on everybody's mind and what is viable in other places, in other areas is also certainly applicable to what we're seeing. And then there are also maybe others that are focused specifically on um, these effects um, of COVID-19. And uh, those are the kinds of things that we'd also like to fund. And you're having two webinars coming up to Thank get more, more people involved, more people aware <laughs> of the work that you're doing and the grants you need and the funding you need to be able to do this research. Tell us, tell us when those are coming up. Absolutely. Our, our next one is October 16th, um, and that is going to be with Dr. Lonnie Shiota talking about her research with emotions and how we can perhaps build an emotional toolkit um, uh, during this time. So again, um, this research is being done not just for the sake of research, but so that we can all benefit from it. And she is one of our newest um, grant recipients. Last, uh, just a few weeks ago, we had Dr. Athena Actippus, who's doing work in interdependence and cooperation. And she also was one of our first uh, grantees as well. And then I believe you're going to have to tell me this November 9th, I believe, is Dr. Felipe Castro, who's done incredible research on resilience. Um, and I think you talked a little bit about that earlier um, in terms of, you know, what, what are some of the things that we can do um, to mitigate some of these things. And he's actually found that even those that have been severely traumatized have found a way to uh, get through things and what can we learn from them. So we're very excited. Um, I'll put the plug in, go to imhr.org. We have all the information about how people can participate, how they can join the webinar. It's free. And we would love to have everybody uh, uh, make themselves, uh, avail, avail themselves of that. So thank you. And showcasing, to, you know, those scientists and those researchers and, and the people that are doing this work and, um, you know, and getting the, the word out that, that you do, you know, you're a nonprofit, you need the money to do that. Yes. Um, and, and so that's important for people to know that Absolutely. you can't do this with no money. <laughs> that's exactly right, because we are the funders. And so what we try to do is be that clearinghouse, if you will, um, because we are institution agnostic. We have um, provided grants um, to probably all the um, institutes in Arizona, um, whether it be the universities, um, TGen, uh, Banner, uh, you know, just uh, again, all, all of them, um, because we just want the best scientists and the best research to, to bubble up. That's huge. And if you did the prevention, you know, and if you, if people knew that they could do the research and then prevent it in the future for some, you know, if something happens again like this, you know, okay, don't sit on your couch. <laughs> Jess is going to tell us, don't sit on your couch too long before you got to get up and do calf muscle pumps. You got to go for a walk, right? Um, you know, talk about your traumas ahead of time and clear those out. I'll tell you, if I didn't clear all the past traumas I had had, this would have been way harder. It seems you know, I don't want to say easy to me, but it's way different now than, you know, 10 years ago that 
if it would have happened to me 10 years ago and had I not cleared all those traumas, you know, to, to have all of that, it's really, really critical that we continue the conversations, continue the work, continue, you know, giving, donating the time, the money to the, to the research, get, taking care of yourself. <laughs> Jess, mm -hmm. tell us a little bit more um, of the after effects, right? So somebody is, they've got restless leg, they've got varicose veins itching, right? All of that, all of those things. Tell us a little bit about the after aftermath or after effect of how. Oh, sure thing. So I'll walk you through a little process of what's going to happen or what happens when we see a patient. Um, they're going to come in and meet our lovely staff. We have about 90 centers, just by the way. Um, Center for Vein Restoration is all over the nation. Um, we pride ourselves on being the largest physician-led practice treating vein disease. Um, our CEO, Dr. Sanjeev Lockenball, has just done a brilliant job with, with even the insurance companies. We set the guidelines with insurance companies. Um, the providers he has working for all of our teams are just amazing. They have written articles in New England Journal of Medicine. They have amazing experience. Uh, Dr. Morrison has a come, where he goes to a nonprofit and he goes to Nicaragua and helps people that can't help themselves. Um, so I like to pride myself on working with people like this because in the end, when we see these patients that are coming in, I can easily walk them through what's going to happen, which I'm going to do now with you. Um, we'll have the patient come in and they're there for about an hour because we want to make sure that we are getting the best scan of their legs that we possibly can. Reasoning behind that is, like I said, we work with insurance carriers and we want to make sure that our patients are never stuck with a bill. They should not be feeling this miserable and then go home and have a nice chunk of money come through the mailbox that they need to pay. So we work very hard to make sure that doesn't happen with the measurements we get. Our nurse works with the providers to make sure we set up a treatment plan properly. And we work with also lymphedema therapists and stockings with Terry Morrison, your lovely mother who does an amazing job setting people up with stockings for us. <laughs> a little more comfortable in between treatments. Um, but the results we have are they'll come in, they have many different treatment plans that we can do for them, like I said, catered to their insurance. They get their procedures, about three to five procedures, with a lovely conversation from Dr. Morrison because he's very knowledgeable. Um, and once their treatments are done, they, we check them for DVTs every one month and then six months. And it's actually way different than, cause we get a lot of people asking, are you gonna strip my veins? Or I'm scared to come in because this is something that they used to do. It's very different nowadays. Uh, in my opinion, it was quite barbaric that this was something they were doing to women, mostly women back when this was happening. Um, the recovery time was months. And now we actually have patients come in on their lunch break. A lot of nurses and doctors come see us on their lunch break and they go right back to work within 20 minutes of a procedure being done. We actually want them walking around. We check up on them. Um, Dr. Morrison is a little personal. So he likes to call, make sure they're having a good day and everything went well with procedures. So that's usually about how each process goes with patients that come in and we want to make them feel as comfortable and welcome as possible. So. I think the fear is in there, right? So we, we only know what we know. And so mm -hmm. if we hear, heard about our grandma, you know, having her veins stripped, we all say, Oh heck no, I'm not doing that. You know, we know mm -hmm. how painful it was, but I know, um, I've heard growing up my whole life, you know, that, that in the 80s, when, when he was stripping, when Dr. Morrison was stripping veins, he's like, there's got to be a better way. There has to be a better way mm -hmm. to do this. This is crazy. This is not right. So he started doing the research, started going to courses. And now, of course, he trains every, all the other physicians in the world about it um, because he's, he's passionate about, we don't, we need to do the minimally invasive. Why have to do, you know, this, all these procedure surgery when we can have it done so easily in the office. Right. So I know she's a big advocate of that. <laughs> That's good. I remember in uh, mid seventies, I think. So I was a young girl, my mom, I remember her varicose veins uh, were, were getting worse and worse and the pain that she experienced. And, and for her, it was 
uh, you know, embarrassment and shame as well. And she had them stripped. And it was, I remember just how painful it appeared. And, and she kept saying to me, even back then, you need to make sure that you're stretching and moving. And, and fortunately, I, because I, it can be hereditary, right? I, I haven't experienced, I don't have spider veins or varicose veins, but is it hereditary? Oh, it sure is. It's very hereditary. Um, a lot of people get it from their jobs as well. I would say obesity, hereditary, from what you do for a living, a lot of nurses, people on their feet all day, firefighters, police officers, teachers. Um, and a lot of it has to do with pregnancy as well. We see a lot of pregnant women that repeat, repetitively are getting varicose veins between pregnancies, which nowadays, like we said, it's, it's an easy fix, but that education and the knowledge is not out there. And these poor people are suffering and they just don't have an outlet or know who to call or, or what to do. So that's where I love to come in handy with the providers and let these providers know, you know, here's some pamphlets. Uh, let me inform you before you inform your patient. And just, we don't want them in pain anymore. Even pelvic congestion, we see pelvic congestion patients that just have had severe pelvic cramping and nothing has been done about it because there's just not many people that are dealing with pelvic congestion in the area. So, or they don't know they, they didn't go to school when they went to medical school, they weren't, you know, they didn't talk about varicose veins. They didn't Correct. talk about vein disease and phlebology that just wasn't a thing when they went mm -hmm. to medical school. So it's so, so important to have the advocacy out there for it. Yes. And when they're done, you know, when, when they've had their treatment, um, you know, then, then they can be healthier and happier and not have to wear the jeans in the summer mm -hmm. and all of it. Right. Then that goes right back to mental health and, and taking care of yourself. The prevention is huge. Um, can you tell us the, you know, besides the obvious, like besides the bulging varicose veins, tell for, for those people who may have other things that they didn't know the correlation. Can you tell us some of the other Oh, I sure can. This is um, one of my favorite parts to speak about because there are so many people struggling with lymphedema right now. Um, lymphedema is very painful. It's, it, lymphedema is when your legs swell up uh, quite large and a lymphedema therapist can work on massaging them. But at the end of the day, there is a reason that their legs are still a little bit more swollen than average. And that sometimes means that there is an underlying what we call venous insufficiency. Um, what we do for that is a little bit of, like I said, the procedures before. So Dr. Morrison will cater to um, what they think will work best with how swollen their legs are. Like I said, their insurance. Um, and that the woman with the nine inches that we were able to get off of her legs, she had no clue that that could have happened with just two procedures um, and then some follow-ups with a lymphedema therapist and a lymphedema pump. Um, another thing that people don't understand is you can have underlying venous insufficiency without seeing any varicose veins or any spider veins. So any aching, burning, swelling, restless legs at night, itching, um, if you see the first signs of skin discoloration, those are all symptoms and signs of you need to come get an ultrasound so we can make sure that you don't develop a DVT. Or if you are being active, that can clot, give you a blood clot. So we wanna fix all that and get you in as soon as possible for an ultrasound. That's good. There's so many people that don't know about that. Same as the, you know, the mental health research, same as the, as the trauma that, you know, the more we can, we can advocate and advocate and talk about it, the better. What are you seeing, Mitzi, in women's health, um, some of the issues that still need to be addressed? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> we need about three more webinars, right? Um, <laughs> unfortunately, you know, it's interesting when we started the Women's Health Center, uh, I won't even tell you how many years ago, I thought, you know, this is a no brainer. And it was, we, we filled up our panels very quickly because there was such a, a need. Um, women didn't feel uh, listened to or taken seriously. And I always, it's not even joking, when I was in medical school, we had a very large physiology book and there's a very small piece at the very end that we almost got to that was uh, women's physiology. So we've come a long way from that, I think, um, in terms of, of knowledge, but we still have so much. And I think that when we think about women's health, and I won't go on a whole lecture, but you think about those things 
that affect women solely for the most part, and those are mostly reproductive health kinds of things, those that um, affect both men and women, but affect women differently, which is cardiovascular health for a good example, the tests and diagnosis and therapeutics are, have to be different in some ways that, than, than men. Um, and then uh, the other is that those are the things that um, are more frequently in women, but perhaps are, are both um, uh, in men and women. And so, you know, issues, what's really been great about Femtech or, or this focus on women's health and entrepreneurship is that the areas that have been perhaps neglected or women felt were neglected are now those women are taking things in their own hands and making the solutions. So we're seeing um, everything from, you know, menopause to reproductive health, lactation um, devices and uh, support. Um, you name it, there's probably an app, a device, or a program for it, or if there isn't, there will be soon. And that's exciting. Um, I think that the gap, perhaps, is where we train our physicians, um, and it really depends on where you, you know, train or go to medical school, what you're going to find. I mean, I, again, I did grand rounds at another university, and I thought, oh, this is like old hat, and I realized that I had been, um, uh, you know, spoiled because the people came up to me and said, we don't have anything like this here. So again, um, and so there's just a lot going on. Um, when we talk about women's health, you can't help but talk about different things um, such as caregivers role, certainly you talked about that, um, uh, issues of violence and, and sexual violence. Um, and of course, racial disparities um, are, and, and you know, it's, it's so um, challenging. We have, I, to go back to the one of the biggest issues that we have is our maternal and infant mortality is the worst in the Western world. And in the last few years, it's gotten worse. So it is more risky to have a baby here than it is. And again, obviously it's segmented and in some um, populations it's more risky than others, but it's still not good. And the question is why? And we're trying to figure that out, but it's a travesty because we spend more per person um, for our healthcare. And if I can, I just want to kind of um, transition this to, to Karen um, with respect to trauma. And how do you deal with people who not only have grown up with trauma, but are still experiencing it? So they just can't shed the past while they're still working on um, the, the current. So I, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that. Uh, so first of all, I think it's important to explain that trauma is relative, right? So um, Kelly, you had mentioned that you had dealt with your trauma, um, whether it's something that we all, the general lay person would say, well, that's definitely traumatic, like, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, sexual abuse, mental abuse, physical abuse, or uh, surviving a car accident. Um, or losing a loved one, like we all can relate and say that's really, that's traumatic, right? Um, and if there's abuse and it's repeated trauma, of course, it gets layered and layered and layered. Um, and then there are also traumatic experiences where, again, shock lives in our body until we're able to reintegrate it. That might, for one person, if it happened to them, may not be significant. I gave the example of my son in third grade. He walked into a class, his classroom after um, being out in the morning for an appointment. And when he walked in the door, the teacher had all the kids sitting down and she turned and looked at him and said, oh, well, we were having a great day until you got here. <laughs> and and he, it was devastating for him, right? And we dealt with it as a oh, family. My gosh. Yeah, we dealt with it as a family, but all these years later, you know, now 13, um, he, it showed up for him to, to heal. So I, I, I would be risky if I answered your question, Mitzi, directly, because I'm still learning myself. I, I don't know how to answer the question if someone is, has not only experienced repeated trauma, but is still in uh, an abusive or traumatic situation, how we help those folks. That's where me as a trauma guide, where we partner with the doctors, the psychologists, the psychiatrists, the counselors, the therapists, because we know what our lane is. And there are often times where someone would benefit from medicating or benefit from a more 
a deeper therapy and of course pulling them out of an unsafe situation if they're doing their personal growth work and they're working with a trauma guide or they're seeing a counselor and a therapist and then they go home and they're in an abusive situation we have to prepare folks for that because when we work and i know you can appreciate this when we work with somebody and we help in uh help them kind of reintegrate. I, we can't leave them unzipped, right? And, and as a certified integrative coach professional, the term coaching, I hate to use it anymore because the last 15, maybe 16, almost 20 years, it's an unregulated field. It's an unregulated industry. Anybody could get online and say, I'd like to be a life coach. And gee, I can do it this weekend and hang up a shingle and, and, and put up a website and call myself a life coach. And it's, it's detrimental if we are uh, doing our own work, healing work on top of people and not know how to zip them back up. Uh, it, it's frightening. Mitzi, I don't know if you want to speak to that, but, but it's frightening. So I, I know that we, we as a guide and a trauma guide, we work in tandem with professionals who, again, have far more schooling and far more experience with uh, that repeated trauma or living in those current situations where they're experiencing over and over again. But I'd love to hear what your thoughts are as I share all that. Mitzi, take yourself off. I, I am. I'm trying. <laughs> you think I'd never been on Zoom before. Um, in any case, thank you for sharing that. And, you know, I don't have much to add. I think that, that you know, I, everything that you said is very thoughtful and makes a lot of sense. But it reminds me of the fact that, you know, kind of buyer beware. And it's really um, very much incumbent on uh, people to know who their practitioners are or who the therapists are. And one of the things, I, I'll just kind of segue to an example of women's health, is that there's um, women are have been so dissatisfied with the traditional um, medical um, system to a lot of extent because it's very, it, it hasn't been very uh, welcoming to women in some ways. I think that that's changing, but um, as, as the face of, of medicine is also changing. But there's also been a lot of people and a lot of um, uh, people selling things, um, whether it be services or products, to kind of take advantage of that. So um, I think that it's really incumbent on everybody, no matter what kind of service or product they're looking for, for their mental health or their physical health, to really understand who's selling it to you and what their, um, their credentials are and also what their training is and what that product is, if that's the case. So I'm glad that you brought that up. And, and how we feel about it, right? I mean, le part of self-care is learning to respect ourselves enough, not only to do the research and, and maybe get a great referral or check out their background, but also let's say Jess and I were friends and if she referred me to somebody, uh, maybe an OBGYN and she raved about this person, I show up there and something doesn't feel right for me, I owe it to myself to be able to say, I, I got to keep looking, right? Because I think so many times I know as a young mom growing up, I thought, you know, the doctor knew more than me. The doctor um, had, you know, more experience and, and, but on those times that I didn't feel right about things, I, I wish I had back then known that I could, could keep looking until there was a better fit or, or even just speak my mind. You know, I have two girls. And I don't want to get too much in the weeds, but to have, as I've realized, I've had to tell them if you're ever in a situation, for example, where you don't feel comfortable, whether it be outside or in the doctor's office, you know, and I can't believe I'm having to have those conversations, but it's so important to just feel your gut and don't be polite and don't be, you know, because we're, we're, you know, socialized to be polite and nice and take care of everybody else. But um, you really have to listen to that little, um, that little voice that's saying it, it just doesn't, you don't even have to know why it doesn't feel right, you know. Just get and out of there. Just get out of there. <laughs> I'd exactly. love to quickly speak on that. Please. I'm 29 years old and I had um, actually pretty severe endometriosis and it was very undiagnosed. Um, I was pushed away in Connecticut from a lot of OB-GYNs. They didn't want to deal with it. Uh, they started to think that it was a false pain and I was in my head and my mental health started to drop a lot. And then I had to go talk to someone about that. 
Um, and then I found a really great doctor. You just, it's really sad that young women have to advocate for themselves um, when, when at the time we probably aren't as knowledgeable and, and these providers will stick you with a bill because we're, we're younger and they, they go through insurance and they'll do any procedure just to um, sometimes have another dollar in their pocket, unfortunately. And I am a strong advocate for all of my friends and family to say, get a second opinion, call your insurance company. Let's see the best way to go about this because you just never know nowadays um, what, what, what you can be stuck with. And it's, it's unfortunate and sad. And that's why I like that we're all here today to speak about this and get that knowledge out there and open some people's ears to being a little bit more self-aware before um, just making one appointment and staying there. You have to feel comfortable with your providers and everyone you see in any aspect of the health world. And that's important for doctors to be okay saying that. I, I mean, Dr. Morrison was great about that. He would say, go get a second opinion. <laughs> you know, don't, don't just trust what I'm saying to you. Get a second opinion and then pick who you feel most comfortable with, you know, because he knew that you have to be not only um, good with the, you know, what the treatment options are, but with the, you know, the personalities and, and, and wanting to make sure you're, you're comfortable. So that's important for people to know, to go to find a provider, to go find a coach, to go find a trauma, you know, guide for investing in, you know, in nonprofits. I mean, you have to do your research, right? You have to make sure you're, you're giving to the right people. You're, you're accepting advice from, from people who know what they're doing to, you know, it's important on all those aspects for sure. Can I just interject? And I think that you're so right. And it just dawns on me that just like, um, you know, women's health and women's health research was late to the game, if you will, or relatively so, um, so has mental health research. And it's kind of a catch 22 because it is difficult because you have so many potential therapeutics, everything from, from pills to, you know, uh, behavioral interventions, right? Um, and but the challenge is, is that there also hasn't been enough research in order to tell us what's going to work and what isn't. And, you know, and again, it's complicated. There's so many variables, but there's so many variables in physical health, too, that we're just now starting to um, appreciate. So, um, you know, I think that, you know, thinking about <clears throat> the value of, of getting evidence-based information is so important. Um, but it may not be out there. <laughs> and so I, you know, again, I hate to be a commercial, but I do want to, um, you know, uh, you know, really encourage folks to think about, you know, supporting research where you feel there's a need for it. And certainly mental health impacts on um, not only our mental health, but our physical health. And we're seeing this now, I think, with respect to um, uh, everything that we're working on. Um, you know, it's interesting, we're in San Diego right now, and the air quality, um, surprisingly, is terrible. And my daughter has asthma, and she's not having any, I mean, she can't really go out because it does bother her, but she wakes up in the morning, and it's, she just feels bad. And then that goes over to, then she's really not um, functioning all that. You know, she's functioning beautifully, I will say that, but I'm just not up to her maximum or optimum and she just says I can I can tell what's going on outside just by the way I feel and um, and and the impact on that I think also on the mental health is also very um, they go hand in hand sure does Je uh, Je I was just gonna say so my daughter is 24 now living in New York but when she left home to go to uh, U of A she ended up having um, some autoimmune situation kind of kick in and she had been other than that a relatively health healthy kid and the strain and the um the deep sadness she had that and kind of like jess was speaking to her experience with endometriosis that that we couldn't find an answer we were at a gastro doctor we we're at you know a, an OBGYN. we were at an with a nutritious a dietitian. i mean we we still don't really know exactly what's going on she's cut gluten out of her diet and she's done some certain things just because like your daughter mitzi she knows what makes her feel better and how to protect herself but I feel for those the kids that 
the women, the, the, even the boys, the, anybody who doesn't have that supportive system around them that, that would just discount what they're saying. Uh, but I, she used to call me in tears, especially when she started living on her own and, and not feeling well. And I'd say, well, get to a doctor. And then she'd call and she's like, they don't have any answers for me. Uh, but more and more, these autoimmune diseases are connected with our emotional and our mental well-being as well. I mean, it's all, you know, we talked about varicose veins. It's all interconnected. So the conversation, Kelly, around self-care, which has kind of been on, on a sideline as we've talked today, is so critical. And yet, Kelly, you and I were in a meeting, a business meeting with, I think, about maybe 30 people not too long ago, a Zoom meeting. And one of the questions was posed, if you had an extra hour in your day, how would you spend that extra hour? And I, I was shocked and surprised how many people were going to take that extra hour and desperately wanting it for more sleep, exercise, read a book, like all the things that, that really... In, in my humble opinion, because I've had to learn over year over years, ought to come first. But we're in such a driven society, and the money, you know, the we got to make money, and I've got to have my kids, you know, I have to have perfect homework taken care of, and, and my house has got to be perfect, and I've got to drive the best car and the you know the best clothing. If we put self care last, which I think many of us are doing, which is why we're in the situation we're in. That's for uh, I, sure. I, I just love that we're having this conversation because, uh, and, it, and it, it's not selfish. I, I, I was taught growing up that it was, it was selfish, you know, that it, it was not okay to, one, feel your emotions, but also to be able to, you know, say, I don't, I don't want to go or I'm going to sleep in an extra hour, or I'm going to go, you know, get a massage. That just kind of was frowned upon. And I'm glad I've shifted it because I don't want to continue that legacy for my kids. I was going to say, and you're being such a great role model for your kids. What I learned, you know, almost too late was that um, I should basically be modeling the behavior I want them to do. And we don't, right? And, uh, or we, you know, too many of us don't. And I'm trying to do that now. And now that they're here, I'm taking advantage of the time. And I would also say that even if you had three minutes, right? Three minutes of just breathing. I know it sounds too simplistic, and I, but there is actual evidence to show that that can relieve your stress. It can lower your blood pressure, that it can make you less foggy. And so I would just, if they take nothing away from this conversation, other than I'm going to wake up and do three minutes of breathing. And before I go to bed, I'm going to do three minutes of breathing. Then you've gotten out what you need to, to get out of this. <laughs> That's for sure. And modeling it, like you said, for the children, I, you know, a lot of people have been asking, how are the kids doing at home? How's everybody been doing? We've been, you know, six months in quarantine because my husband's a fireman. I knew he was going to get COVID. He got COVID. We were protecting everybody else, right? To make sure that we weren't passing this around. And everybody is constantly asking me, how are the kids doing? How are the kids doing? They're trying to do school and they're, you're trying to work and how is this all going? And I said, if I model the behavior that I want to see in them, if I consistently say to them, show up every day, what's the silver lining today? What are we thankful for today? I'm thankful today that I got to play dominoes with my daughter at lunchtime, you know? I'm thankful that I came home just in time to see her doing the chicken dance and PE, you know? Like, they're, like they're just this little stuff that, you know, that is, you have to, it's mindset. It's, it's taking care of yourself first and modeling that, you know, luckily growing up, I saw my parents model that behavior, take a vacation, go do, you know, go by themselves and be by themselves and do that. And so now it's okay, we have our day nights and we have our vacation time and we have all these things and that's first. So if we can learn it now, even like you said, it might be too late, Mitzi, but it's not, you know, for your kids and your grandkids and continue to model that behavior for the younger generations. So that now my daughter's school is doing um, yoga for, you know, and, and then learning how in art, they're learning how to draw um, to calm themselves during their Zoom calls to, to do that. Oh my gosh, I know, I know nobody can hear us on because we're, we're on air um, on radio, but everybody's clapping and smiling and nodding their heads. I know <laughs> everybody can get off mute so then everybody can hear us. But um, 
But anyways, I, you know, I just think that you, we can do something. It's not too late to take care of yourself. It's not too late to, to work on mental health. And I'm sure that we could have two hours more conversation, but of course we're already at an hour. So I know, can you believe it, Karen? Karen always, we always say, what? How has it already been an hour? Thank you all so much for being on today. I really, really appreciate it. Can you please, each of us, um, each of you tell everybody where they can contact you, what, you know, the name of the best place to contact you, the name of the business and that. Karen? Sure. So um, feel free to reach out to me if, uh, if you're looking for support around uh, mental health, uh, trauma integration, or even uh, if you want to learn how to do some breath work, like Mitzi said, it's really easy. You breathe in, you breathe out, uh, <laughs> nice and deep. Uh, but there are also, also some really great medita meditative techniques uh, that don't take very long. So you can reach me at karennowicki2007 at gmail.com uh, around that. Uh, and of course, Phoenix Business Radio X. Uh, I'm here to help with uh, business owners and professionals who want to get the word out about their businesses as well, but I'm, I, I'm on all social media platforms except for Twitter. I don't get Twitter, so <laughs> I've never been there. But you can find me on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn as well. And I just want to be an advocate for uh, our community here in Arizona. We are a beautiful melting pot, and I love Mitzi the work that you're doing to have you share that we now have some seed investors specifically around femtech. Just blows my mind because oftentimes in these conversations, one we talk about the lack of investment that's here in Arizona alone, but to have it specifically centered around women, I'm, I'm thrilled to hear Yay! That. <laughs> I know, I'm so excited me. too. Thank you for being on. Mitzi, tell us where we can reach you. Sure. Um, just like Karen, I'll give you a couple of different options depending on which column you're in. Um, certainly, if you'd like to learn more about our research and mental health as well, and our researchers and find out how you can participate uh, in, in supporting us, it's at imhr.org. And if you're interested as an entrepreneur or as a potential angel investor, you can find information about us at goldenseeds.com. And I will just say that if you are an entrepreneur with an investable um, company um, or have questions about that and you're either a female founder or a female um, uh, leader in that in, um, organization, uh, we have office hours where we uh, entertain uh, entrepreneurs and just uh, to meet and uh, perhaps uh, give uh, advice or, or feedback. And so you can look at that also on the Golden Seeds uh, website. So thank you for that opportunity. And thank you, Kelly, for, for having me today. We could do a whole hour on entrepreneurship. I might have to have you back and do, and do a whole show around that one. <laughs> Be glad to. <laughs> Jess, tell us where we can reach you and uh, CDR. Sure thing. So if you guys are having any of these symptoms, you'd like to hear more about it, you can go on and also book an appointment at www.centerforveinrestoration.com. We have just about every social media platform that you can look us up on there as well. And I just want to say thank you to all of you lovely women for being so vulnerable today. And this even was therapeutic. So I'm very happy that I did this with you all. Yay, I'm so glad. Thank you for being on with us. Now you'll have to give a report to my dad about how it went. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I sure will. <laughs> Thank you all so much for listening to Collaborative Connections radio show and podcast sponsored by KLM Consulting. Until next time, happy connecting. Mm -hmm.